I also have our missionary update uh, for this evening. We have the Kings to Albania. And he starts out saying, Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, he says, the warfare is real. And he has 2 Corinthians uh, 7, 5. He says, For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. And he says, This verse describes our time here ever since we returned to Albania four months ago. Never have we seen such uh, intensive spiritual battles. Many of, you re- many of you remember we were we are asking God to do big things here as he is a big God. When your goal is to take back ground from the devil and see souls saved, you will no doubt experience warfare. On a sad note, uh, the young man that I have been training for the ministry for the last two years has decided that Baptist doctrine is too narrow for him. He was influenced greatly by his Pentecostal mother and is no longer with us. It was a sad time for us, and please pray for Arnold. On a glad note, a young man of 15 was saved a few months ago and feels the Lord wants him to preach. I am in the process of taking him through the ABCs of Christian growth. He says, please please pray for Luciano as I disciple him and try to help him grow in the Lord. So we have a time of baptism scheduled for September 17th. Uh, There are three that have made professions of faith and need to follow the Lord and believers' baptism. As you may remember from our last prayer letter, we found it necessary to totally restart the work here in Vlora. We were bogged down with many attending and never desiring to join the church, even though I believe they were saved and they were having a negative effect on the work. Without going into more detail, we basically restarted another work. There has been more liberty to preach, and we have seen several saved. One of the challenges we have is that we are reaching many of the neighborhood children. Last Wednesday night, we had 25 young people from ages 5 to 15 come to church. It was very hard to minister to them, as many had never been made to obey, sit still, and listen. But we will do our best to get the gospel to those that will listen. Besides our main objective of church planting, please remember to pray for us as we are not sure of our next step of ministry here. The need is great everywhere in this country. So, got got some changes going on there and got some good things and some sad things. Uh, But, uh, you know, they're still just being faithful to what the Lord has called them to do. And so, praise the Lord for that. Let's go ahead and take another moment now and we will bring uh, these things before the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, God, we come to you and want to thank you for this update from the kings and just for their faithfulness and uh, following you. <coughs> Excuse me, as you lead them, dear Lord, I uh, pray that you would uh, just continue to give them wisdom as to um, what the next step of their ministry might be, what you have in store for them, dear God. I pray that you just make it clear and that you would uh, be with those that were saved recently, that you'd help them to grow in you, uh, especially this one that was mentioned, Luciano, dear Lord, as uh, he feels you working on his heart to preach your word, Father, and I pray that you'd be with him, that you'd help him to grow close to you, that he would stay true to your word, O oh Lord, and uh, that you'd be with the baptism service coming up, and that you would just uh, bless that in a special way, Father God, and that perhaps uh, it would even be a time for others to see this uh, declaration of faith that these others have made, Lord, and that they would want to follow in those steps as well, Father. I pray that you'd be with Arnold and work in his heart and help him to know truth from your word, O Lord, that he would not be... uh, pulled aside by the things of this world, dear God, by false doctrine, Lord, but help them to uh, to get into your word and to learn truth, Father, and I pray that you just do a great work there as well, and thank you again just for the kings and uh, the, their faithfulness to you, Father, I pray that you'd watch over them, provide for them, protect them, encourage them, Lord, and continue to use them in a great way, I pray in Christ Jesus' name, amen.
All right, grab your songbooks. You can turn this down just a hair. All right, page 294 to start with this evening. 294 is My Savior's Love. out like you mean it this evening on the first. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song my will but thine. He had no tears for his own grief, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. my soul that night. How marvelous, how wonderful, and Amen. Sing it out. Is my Savior's love for me on the fourth? He took my sins and my sorrows. He paid them his very died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful is my sin. <laughs> Amen. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. On the last, when with the ransomed in glory, His face I at last shall see. Turn over to page 649. 649 is a mansion over the hilltop. And why don't we stand, stretch our legs a little bit. Let's see if we can be louder than the kids downstairs. We can do hallelu, hallelu. <laughs> Matt and Andrew's like, let's do it. Mansion over the hilltop. Amen. On the first, here we go. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold. Yeah, 
Bedford Road And someday yonder We will never more wander But walk on streets that are purest gold No soft Thank you, Ms. Connie. The teens dismissed. We'll be over in Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs 19, we're going to begin with verse 6 and 7. We started on that last week, and there are several, several things we want to look at, so why don't we pick up there if we can. If you can stand and join me, we're going to read just a few verses. Um, beginning with verse 19, 6. It says, Many will entreat the favor of the prince, and every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. All the brethren of the poor do hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He pursueth them with words, yet they are wanting to him. He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul, and he that keepeth understanding shall find good. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. Delight is not seemly for a fool, much less... For a servant to have rule over princes. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, but his favor is as dew upon the grass. Foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are continual dropping. Houses and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. We'll be, begin with, see how far we make it on that. You may be seated. We touched on it last week a little bit, just as we are closing. Chapter 19, verse 6 and 7 is, a, again, looking at the rich versus the poor. 
and it says, Many will entreat the favor of the prince. This time, not so much one in it with wealth as much as one that has power and wealth combined as a prince, and uh, com contrasting that to the poor. And back in chapter 19, verse 4, it looked at this also. It says, Wealth make, maketh many friends, but the poor is separated from his neighbor. Um, partiality is a key thing we've got to be careful about. I am glad the Lord is not partial Amen. one toward another, not by position, anything. He is just, he looks at us all as all of one blood and all sinners needing a Savior. Amen. So with that thought, look at a few things here. We, we do have a great prince that has bestowed his favor upon us. And uh, many will look to the, to the physical prince and try to entreat and try to seek favor from him um, because of his power. We have a prince that has all power and is willing to give us, bestow favor. Favor is grace. And to be able to, to bestow grace upon us and... Uh, He's extended gifts of grace, and then he encourages us to entreat, to, which means to request or to petition the Father. We have awesome ability to have great things from God. But yet, verse 7 talks about the poor. It's sad, it says the poor is basically abandoned by many around him. And again, we looked last time, it talked about the neighbor. And neighbor is the ones in your neighborhood, the ones of the same abilities. You know, usually they don't have rich and poor living right next to each other. So your neighbors are the ones of your own uh, social status, let's say it that way. And for them to turn against you, it's sad, but uh, many times the poor will do that. They, they abandon others around them because they look at them as they have nothing to give them and it's all about getting from them instead of giving and uh, we need to treat the rich and poor alike back in James chapter 2 he goes into great detail and gives the example of a uh, church gathering together and a rich man comes in the door and they want to treat him greatly and they want to put it in a position of honor want to have a special seat for him but then they literally say a poor man comes in and they say you can sit under my footstool that's sad but that's how we can treat people just by their social status and yet a rich man more than likely is not going to not be a blessing to you he'll be a curse to you he, he thinks he has everything many times, not always, but many times those that have riches don't want anything to do with God. They don't think they need God. And so they're, they're pretty well thinking, you know, I'm good, I, I take care of myself. And for them to come to a church would be for a social thing. And yet, it says Jesus says it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because they got to go over their riches and they got to basically remove their riches out of the equation before they can truly see the need for Christ. You got a poor man. Jesus says he came to the poor. He preached the gospel to the poor. I'm glad for that. I grew up poor and I understand. And I'm thankful that God doesn't have any partiality toward me or anyone else because of anything about me, he is willing and long-suffering and more than able to take care of the sins of the whole world. And he desires for everyone to be saved, not willing that any should perish. It is a very universal gospel in that aspect, the invitation for it. It's open to all, rich or poor alike. Sad part, the poor will miss it. 
the poor will, the, excuse me, let me say again, the rich will miss it, the poor will have a better opportunity to see the need and accept the gift of God than a rich man. With that thought, um, got a couple examples. We're talking about in verse 6 about the prince. And David was a great man of God, and yet his sons were princes and had some struggles there. One particular one thought of was um, uh, Absalom, particularly, and then later on, uh, Adonijah. Both of those were older sons than Solomon. Absalom, this is way before Solomon even got to a point to close to the, to the throne. Absalom went and tried to use his position as prince, and he drew a crowd to him because he was seeking a crowd that he could control and, and then overthrow his dad. But using his position as a prince, he sought and was able to say, like a politician, oh, if you would make me king, I would be able to do all these things. And he got a lot of people to bend their ear and to follow him, and yet um, he was not of God, it wasn't of God, and, and it's sad what happened there. And then later on, when Solomon took the throne, his older brother Adonijah was trying to usurp the throne from him, even though it was very clear and it had been stated very clearly that Solomon would be the, the one that would take the throne from David. Adonijah, the older brother, said, I'm older, I, I deserve that. And he too grew, uh, drew a, grew, uh, a great crowd to him, including Joab, one of the high priests, and different position, people of positions of power came and followed Adonijah and were preparing to make him king until the Lord stepped in and through Nathan the prophet and, and everything. But he drew a crowd because he was a prince. There are people today, it it's, just baffles me. A person can be an actor. That is a paid hypocrite. By definition, that's what an actor is. They just play a part. You, you with me so far, okay? How an actor can go to Washington and stand before Congress like he has anything more than anybody else to say about a matter, whatever the topic is, sad. But he's in a position of fame, so therefore we entreat him like a prince, and we give him a special status, or her, in the case may be. God has no respect for persons, and God can see the hearts. But let's, let's keep going here. Um, another example real quickly was Job. Job had many friends in Job chapter 1. He was a wise man. He was a rich man. God's blessing was upon him. And it, he talks about it later. It's in about chapter 32, somewhere about in there. He says that when people walk down the street, they stop to listen to what he would say. But then the calamities came. We know from the account that it came by the way of the devil. But the calamities came. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. And he lost his friends. And he talks about how that no one, people would actually come up and mock him. Here he's in pain and in suffering and people were coming and mocking him. Whoa. We need to be careful how we treat others. Because though we might want to be a prince, there's a better chance we're going to be a pauper. And, and there's only a few princes. There's a lot of paupers. And we need to be careful that we treat people for who they are, a child of God, 
hopefully a saved child of God, but a, a, a created person from God, we need to take and be careful how we treat people. Let's go on back to 19, chapter 19, verse 8. It says, He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul, and he that keepeth understanding shall find good. thought this is interesting. We are told to get and to keep wisdom. You can go back to chapter 2. Turn back here just a little bit. Chapter 2 is on the very beginning of the book of Proverbs. The first nine chapters is a great foundation and talking about how the words of a father to a son, but he says this very clearly, chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou shalt incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart unto understanding, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seeketh her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. It goes on from there. God gives us wisdom. Later in chapter 4, uh, verse 5, he says this. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth, forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee, love her, and she shall keep thee. Here it's talking about wisdom as personified, as a person, and it's in the, the uh, uh, feminine gender, uh, the, the word is, so that's why it uses her. Verse 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. We're to get wisdom and, and, and understanding, and yet, um, when we do so, it is an act that really is loving our own soul and trying to preserve our own soul. I'm going to give you a couple of verses, or you can turn back here with me. Keep your finger in Proverbs. Go back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Again, Deuteronomy was Moses' last sermon to the new generation before he was taken home. So the whole book of Deuteronomy, that whole book is his last sermon. And, and chapter 4 is where he really starts getting into the uh, presentation he's going to give here. Chapter 5, he will actually re revisit the Ten Commandments. Chapter 6, he really comes, we'll look at it in a second. But in Deuteronomy chapter 4, look down at verse 5. Again, he's repeating this for this new generation. They, some of them were kids. Some have been born in this wilderness time of 40 years. Now they're the ones in charge. Now they're the ones going to go into the promised land. In chapter 4, verse 5, he says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Look at verse 6. Keep therefore and do them... These commandments, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of nations which shall hear of all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Go on down from here to verse 9. Here he says this, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thine heart all the days of thy life, but teach them unto thy sons and thy sons' sons. And it goes on, especially the things he talked about there at Sinai is in verse 10. But now jump over to chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. He's talked about the commandments, the word of God given to them, is their wisdom. And now in chapter 6 he makes this statement. You probably know this one, but chapter 6, verse 5, it says, we'll pick up at verse 4. Chapter 6, verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. thing I want you to understand, God gives us wisdom, and it is our responsibility to get and to keep that wisdom, and it is one of our highest duties to do is to get the wisdom of God's word and to put it in our heart and to apply it and keep it and guard it. 
because everything we do is going to be based upon that. And uh, so many people, it's, it's sad, it talks about it in the Minor Prophets, that one day there will be a famine. Not so much for bread, but for the Word of God. And we're seeing that in America right now. There are Bibles everywhere. They're available to any. And yet uh, we have mission groups that are going and going across the world. And you can literally take a case of Bibles, stand on a corner and hand them out. And people will stand in line. And then when they get it, they will sit there and stop and read it. And keep reading and reading because they've never seen one before. A Bible in their language. And they are very understanding where we have Bibles sitting around, but we never bothered to read them. We've got to get wisdom and then keep wisdom. And doing so is really loving our own soul. God wants us to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, with all our soul, all our mind. As we learn about God and we hide in our heart, we will truly love God, and it, it is a blessing to our soul. Is the thing he's getting here in Proverbs, back in Proverbs 19, 8. Back in Proverbs 19, 8, turn back there. Again, it says, he that keepeth wisdom, no, excuse me. He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. Sorensen, in his commentary, said this. says, having a heart for others, in reality, is love for one's own soul. As you love others, you truly love yourself. And it's reciprocal. As you love, you are loved. Back uh, in chapter 18, it says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. As we are friendly toward others, we have many that will be friends with us. Not all, it's always, you know, but you, there's a few out there. You've seen some of those, Brother Lane, yeah. But uh, as a whole, you, you are friendly, you're going to increase friends. As you love others, you will be loved. And as we get wisdom, you're really loving your own soul because it's going to bless your soul to do so. He that keeps... And the word keeps means to guard and really to apply. He that keeps, guards, applies, understanding shall find good. We reap what we sow. And uh, the world keeps thinking that somehow they can sow wickedness and perversion and then reap goodness and peace. It doesn't work that way. You, you, you sow, you reap. And we've got to be careful what we're sowing. I pray. I praise God that the, you know I grew up wild and, and stupid, and early as 17 when I got saved and hadn't got into too many things, but I was on a, a spiral heading down. And yet, the grace of God, He extended His grace to me. And at the same time, I, I think about it. If it hadn't been for the grace of God, I probably wouldn't be alive now. There's several times that I had an almost accident. And a couple of them, particularly right before I got saved. And it's just like, uh, well, one, I remember stopping a car, or the car stopped. I, did, I was... It was out of control. And uh, it stopped right in front of a telephone pole. And then stopping and looking at that po telephone pole, and it's going, wow. And the Lord was getting hold of me. And, and we got to be careful. We sow what we reap. And without the grace of God and God's forgiveness... We're going to reap. But once we are saved, we ought to really be more so sowing wisdom 
and understanding and keeping it and then sharing it with others. As we are friendly with others, they're friends to us. As we share love with others, they're going to love us. And we need to be sowing the right things. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. As a whole, yes. It's a principle. This, this, the, are there people that get persecuted? Yes. But as a whole, I can't think of anything better to do with my life. No matter what happens tomorrow. Nothing could change tomorrow that would say, well, maybe I'd give up this stuff. Oh, it's been a blessed life. It's been good. And everything I see about the future is even better. There is nothing that could cause me to say, it's been foolish to be trying to find the wisdom of God and the understanding of God and, and doing the good things. Sowing good, sowing righteousness is a good thing. And it's, it's, a, it's a great life. No matter what the world thinks they get away with, I know there's another page in their story. There's a day coming. One day they will stand before God. And they'll have to give account. One day I will stand before God in heaven and give account of what I've done with my life since I got saved. That's a lot better than what the world is looking forward to. Let's go on. Example I've got, the life of Timothy. Back in 2 Timothy, uh, let me just read it for you real quickly. It talked about his uh, upbringing, and in chapter 3 they say this, we know 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Well, right before that says this. Paul tells Timothy, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. And he that getteth understanding shall find good. Timothy is a good example of that. Paul went through lots of struggles, but he would say, praise God, everything was great. Because to God be the glory. Let's go on. Chapter 19, verse 9 of Proverbs is a, a repeat and it's not by accident, it's not by uh, error from a copyist, but uh, it's something that uh, when my mom told me twice, I better listen. I should have listened the first time, okay? Well, when he says something for the second time, back in 19.5, he says, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape going to be judgment coming down in verse 9 he says a false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall perish that's the change and even more so adding to it it's repeated and tells the judgment giving is not just judgment but it's going to be perish and except for the forgiveness of God and the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ all this talking about false witnesses. And again, a fa false witness is a liar that goes onto a stand and, and bears false witness against somebody else. So it's a special class of liars. When they're publicly in a place of judgment, giving false witness to condemn somebody that evidently is honest. Some, somebody is doing right for a false witness is a special degree of liars. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 8 says, All liars shall have their part. A place called hell. Revelation 21, 8. We've got to be careful. Um, we should never be involved in false witness. Let's go on. Chapter 19, verse 10. 
Chapter 19, verse 10 says, Delight is not seemly for a fool, much less for a servant to have rule over princes. And we're going to think I've got enough time to get this in and look at this. Let's start with the last part of that verse, and then it will explain the first part. So we'll start with the second part that says, uh, Much less for a servant to have rule over princes. Servants ruling over their masters or rulers will tend to be harsh and cruel. The, back in chapter 28 and verse 3, let me just turn back there real fast. 28.3 we'll, we'll get to eventually. It says, a poor man that oppresses the poor. Just grasp, grasp that first phrase. The poor man that oppresses the poor. Means a man that doesn't have a lot, but yet in his poor condition, he sees another poor man and he wants to do harm and oppress him and to rule over him. Here we have, back in 1910, a servant ruling over princes. We see it's sad, but many times the poor that don't know Christ are going to want to still be in a place of ruling over someone else. And... Um, a case in mind just happened to come to my mind is Matthew chapter 18. Talks about a man that had a debt. And I want to say it was like 10,000 talents. It was completely bizarre, beyond reason of how much debt it was. You know, it was beyond. There was countries that had a tribute paid to other countries of talents. And this man owes 10,000 talents. It's just a bizarre number. It's like St. Gazillion. Beyond ever being able to repay it. You got that picture. He goes to his Lord and says, Give me time and I'll pay it all. Gazillions? No, you can't do it. The master forgave him all. I mean, you know the story. Then he went out and saw a guy that owed him basically uh, a small amount. He could have paid it off in a year or less. It was, I forget the exact amount, but it was a small, trivial amount. Something that was a debt, but still small. And he refused to forgive him, but cast him into debtor's prison until he would pay all of it. You see, a poor man, many times, with no Christ will still try to judge others. Let's go a little bit farther. When given the opportunity, servants usually don't make good decisions as they're not used to making decisions. They're make, used to having decisions made for them. So with that example, the word delight here in verse 10, the word delight means luxury, delicate, pleasant. Something set aside for someone special, delight. It's not seemly or comely or becoming for a fool. Got some examples for you real quick. Back in Exodus chapter 32, Moses was up on the mountain, been there for 40 days. The people got to where they were curious. Remember they said, Moses, you go talk to God because if he talks to us one more time, we're probably going to die. So he's been gone for 40 days. And they say, we don't know what happened to Moses. Well, what they're saying is we think he's probably dead. God probably killed him and he's not coming back. So we're going to be in charge. And soon they came up with the idea to make a golden calf and revert back to the golden the, the the idols from Egypt that they had had when they were in slavery. You see, they're not made, or not made, not uh, used to making decisions. They had gone for hundreds of years with being told what to do and when to do it and how to do it and just not having to make any decisions. And now they get a chance, it goes to their head. They had no wisdom or discernment, their decisions were led by their fleshly lust. Another example I have is a man named Joseph. Joseph was a son that had been given favor 
from his dad. And because of that, his other brothers, his older brothers, were thinking about killing him, but ended up selling him into slavery down in Egypt. How many know the story? You with me? Here's a man that had a position as the one with the coat of many colors, the place of prestige within the family. Now he's a servant in a foreign land, probably don't know if he knows the language. He's got to learn the language, and he's got a job to do. And yet, he works hard, and he excels. He becomes so, so proficient at the job that the master realizes that whatever he does gets blessed. You know, I'm going to give him a higher position, and it kept moving him up to where he was the head of the household as a slave. Remember that part. But he chose to follow God no matter what circumstances was in. And then he was falsely accused. And just in my own mind, I, I happen to think that Potiphar probably had some suspicions because he, a slave be accused of this, of trying to commit adultery with his wife would have been executed. Joseph was thrown in prison. Maybe Potiphar had some questions and doubts, but yet still Joseph finds himself in prison now. He's not gone up by all this hard work he's done. He's gone down. And now he's got chains, and now he's serving other prisoners with his chains, and yet the Lord was with Joseph. And God blessed him as he worked and served and looked to others. And the next thing, he's the keeper of the whole prison underneath the prison you know, master. He's the guy that's on the inside that's doing all the work and taking care of everything and organizing everything. He meets the butler and the baker. And all of a sudden, he's ushered off to meet Pharaoh. And as he interprets a dream, he is given the position of prime minister of Egypt second in command he has all authority over all the people of Egypt except for Pharaoh that means he has authority over the captain of the guard his name was Potiphar remember the guy that threw him in prison he now had to bow down before Joseph Potiphar's wife yeah she had to bow down before Joseph those in the prison He's over them too. And yet, here's a man that through this, he ruled wisely and still had grace toward those that had mistreated him or used him as a stepping stone, so to speak, trying to advance themselves. Well, now he's in charge. And then his brothers come. And he shows, extends grace to them. Once he tests them for a while, but he wants to see, are they being honest with him? Is there any remorse there? And he shows grace and extends grace even after Jacob, the father, dies. He says, I'll take care of you. You don't have to worry. You meant to evil, but God meant for good. And he extends grace. Here's a servant that actually learned to serve others. Real quickly, John Phillips, in his uh, commentary, made a comment. and he, He's uh, an English background, and yet he spent a lot of time in Canada, and he became a, uh, uh, one of the directors at uh, uh, Moody Bible Institute on their correspondence school. He did a lot of instrumental stuff with that. But he has a lot of things about history. John Phillips says this about Man, back in England, this is back in the 1100s, there was a man named King Richard the Lionhearted. I mean, you have heard, maybe heard that name? There's a man underneath him, his name, uh, they're not sure if he actually made the name up, but his name came was, was uh, William D. Longchamp, and he was nicknamed as the Hobgoblin Chancellor of England. You see, Richard was off fighting crusades. Make this real quick. 
He was off fighting crusades, and William Long, de Longchamp had one quality about him. He was a good fundraiser, and Richard needed money to go to take care of the war, so he left him in charge as he went off to fight the battles. And he raised money. He was good at it, but he was a man that really had no training and no skill. He made very foolish decisions. He was auctioning off half of Richard's stuff, and he was doing crazy things. Then he was taking in people that had some wisdom. He kicked them out of office and found other buddies that he brought in and put them in positions of power. And because of it, England just about fell through while Richard was off fighting the war. Finally, the word got to him. He had come back, and William was banished. Servants, untrained, can make very poor decisions. We need to be careful. We are servants of the Lord. And if we get some, somehow idea that, hey, I have this great position now, and I'm a child of God, I can do whatever I want. No. God called us as sons, but yet every young son is a servant until they get old enough to understand and claim their sonship. Galatians chapter 4 talks about it. You have several young boys. You're not ready for any of them to start driving yet, are you? <laughs> no. You want to train them first. Yes, you are a child of God, but we start as servants. And as we learn and as we humbly obey and follow, we will get the training that we can be servant leaders. What did Jesus tell his disciples on the night before the cross? He says, when you can learn my example and learn to wash feet, then you'll be good servants, servant leaders. You need to look, look at my example. The last example he gave them before he left to go to the garden, to, to the cross, was to wash disciples' feet, including Judas. It's probably still there. We need to be servants and not get over filled with our great ability. We just need to obey what God has. He told us in the verse before, we need to get, get wisdom, keep it, get understanding, and you'll find good. Don't be worrying about ruling. Just be a servant. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're truly thankful for this day you've given us, the opportunity we, we have that we can come and just out of your great mercy and grace, you allow us to be child, a child of God. And yet help us, O oh Lord, to serve. And have a servant's heart. And allow you to have your will and way done in us. God, lead us now, O oh Lord, for we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. God bless. You're dismissed.